things than that, but that's fundamentally what it is. Um, and this is an Orpheus audio interface, such as you plug into your Mac or your PC, um, to record or play back with it. And uh, we've always had this problem of sitting on the fence a little bit over what's a good sound, you know, because on the one hand we've got to be true to our sort of uh, values as a measurement instrument manufacturer and as an engineering company. On the other hand, we've also got to be sympathetic to the people that musical sound, a good sound, or, or whatever it is. And it occurred to me uh, recently that I should look a little bit at the issue of psychoacoustics and perception, because that's a big part of what the discussion is all about. And I came across some very interesting work uh, talking to a colleague recently, and um, he was kind enough to let me have a, a presentation that he worked on, which includes some very interesting well, I think very interesting stuff on psychoacoustics, um, which, which has relevance to this problem of assessing things by listening to them. It's not to say that you can't do that, of course, it's the only way you can do it, but um, it makes us realize just how complicated and difficult that is. Um, and I hope that, uh, aside from anything else, you find it a bit of fun. Uh, it lightens things up a little bit. I've 
I've got far too many slides, so I'm going to race through the stuff that I've got. Some of it, probably a lot of it, will be revision for many of you, but for those of you that it isn't, uh, do feel free to slow me down and ask questions if you, know, if you want some explanation. So let's get stuck in. <coughs> Can you all hear me still okay? I haven't lost my voice yet. Is that right? Good. Okay. Should have had a wireless one of these. Aaron, one thing is that you may not be picking up the mic as much without your. If you're going to be walking around with that mic, I can your position that. Uh, do you want me to put this thing on? Okay. I haven't got it on. Just try to put it on and see what we have for. How's that? Is that any better? Be better yeah. yeah? Okay, I should have used it. Sorry about that. It's okay. <coughs> yeah, the recording. Yeah, of course, I should have thought. <laughs> Okay, so we, we've kind of done that. Um, uh, Prism sound, I, I mentioned the test equipment and the converters, but uh, we also have some analog outboard stuff, and um, we recently bought into the SAGI business a couple of years ago, um, mainly because we, had, uh, we, we knew the core of, of users, uh, and they were so passionate about it and so insistent that somebody should save it. And, uh, and, and rescue that business when they got into difficulties um, that we, we did and uh, it's been uh, you know a great um, uh, source of satisfaction for us to be involved in that in that business and to be serving those customers since uh, 2008 we also make logging recorders we, we do a lot of audio stuff and uh, the most prominent application of our loggers is in the British Parliament where we have a big four server system record uh, recording about 16 channels of uh, different uh, legislative assembly um, committees and, 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 the, the, the ch and the House of Commons, the House of Lords, the two Houses of Parliament. Um, we have about 200 or so users doing transcription on that system. So, so that's us. Um, so part one of my talk tonight um, is going to be talking about the subject of resolution and high quality audio, just, just really refreshing what that's all about. Um, and part two is going to be that little bit of stuff on psychoacoustics, which hopefully uh, stimulates you to think about how you uh, do the listening part of, of, of all this. So uh, what do we mean by sound quality? It means different things to different people. Um, we're going to have a little brief look at that um, and try and nail down what, what we mean and differentiating between you know, good technically uh, reference quality, you know, pleasing and all those things. And then we're going to dive in and have a quick look at resolution in the digital audio domain uh, and just prove something. Actually, this is uh, obviously, with being an AES section meeting, this is obviously a very educated audience. So I'd like to ask you a question, first of all. Um, how many of us think that 24-bit um, is, is better than 16? <coughs> Yeah. Because it allows the bigger processor. It's louder, isn't it? <laughs> uh, well, we, it's, it's kind of interesting that because not many people dare to put their hands up. But I, I, oh, think, they, what you mean by I think that's because they think people perhaps think that it's a trick question, which obviously it is. Hmm. <laughs> not many people wanting to stick their necks out. Okay. Um, well, we're going to have a look at that, um, and then we're, when we've had a look at that. Uh, we're going to uh, look at some of the things that go wrong with, with practical converter designs and have a quick illustration of that. And then we're going to dive into the sound psychoacoustic stuff. So, sound quality, pleasing to some, you know, boosted bass and treble, hit the loudest button, turn up the tone controls. You know, some people like that and think that that means it's a good sound. Um, certain pair of speakers, you know, this, I prefer these speakers over that speaker, which is right. Um, Speakers work better in some rooms than others. You know, uh, big speakers, you need a big room mostly. Um, tube amplifiers, certain kinds of distortion. Some people actually like the sound of compressed audio. Uh, it, it, it's, I've often heard it said that kids like it. Um, you know, the, the, the older people who are not used to it don't like it. I don't know whether that's true. Um, so we, we have to distinguish between what we mean by accurate and and pleasing in when we're talking about quality or good sound, you know, what's a good sound? Um, most of what we're trying to do 
at Prism Sound is about accuracy, I have to admit. Um, that's not to say that we, we don't, you know, that, that we're in any sense uh, uh, sniffy about things that are pleasing but not accurate, but most of what we're doing in, in our development is focused on the issue of accuracy. Um, is expensive gear better? Well, our stuff is pretty expensive. Um, the, the reason is that we spend an awful lot of time on it. You know, we, we, products don't come out every year. We don't have a new model every year. Um, but we do spend a lot of time honing them and refining and getting them to work really well. And that's why it takes, it takes a lot of time and that's why it's expensive. Um, so what are we trying to achieve? Accuracy, I've mentioned. Um, Sometimes we might want to change the sound, sometimes we don't. But we need to understand the tools that we're using. Actually, I've just realized that uh, I've started this off and included some of the slides I wanted to skip. So bear with me while I restart it as a custom show rather than showing them all because we'll be here forever if I do that. <coughs> saving for me. Okay, I'll just skip through to where I need to be. Okay. So let's have a look at some thinking about sound quality. Um, if we've reduced something to 16 bits, going back to that question, bear that question in mind. Um, undithered, it might sound distorted on the, on the low levels, where I think we're probably all familiar with that. Um, if you measured it, if, if you measured a sine wave truncated, you probably measured distortion at about minus 96 dB. Dithered, it sounds cleaner, but it's noisy. And the distortion measurement or distortion plus noise measurement is 93. So it's slightly worse, but it's better. Dither is noise, of course. It can be heard easily if you turn the, turn the level up. And even at sort of moderately high listening levels, you can still hear uh, white flat dither. Noise shaping is useful in reducing that, but it, um, of course, increases the noise in the HF. And if you measure it unweighted, or even with something like A weighting, um, it'll measure significantly worse. So THDNN is, is hopeless as a measurement when you're looking at a noise shape result. A lot of people actually will quite happily work without it, or, or, or um, uh, you know rely on uh, um, you know either the, 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 the intrinsic noise or simply prefer uh, to, to, to uh, create the sound uh, that, that it makes when it is truncated. So. It's a subjective choice at the end of the day. Um, so some, you know, some contradictions there. I mean, it's certainly just a, a straightforward distortion measurement doesn't tell us that something's better. Um, loudspeaker is another good example. Um, there's a lot of second and third harmonic distortion in the speaker, probably at least a thousand times more than in the average converter. So in terms of the sort of distortion and imperfection, it's way more important than the converter. But um, a lot of second and third. But um, if you've got a buzzy speaker then you've got lots of high order harmonics going right up uh, you know, as, far as, as far as it goes. And um, those can be extremely irritating and, and extremely obvious to a listener, but they can sometimes be quite hard to pick up by measurement, particularly because of this, you know, the high second and third. So when you're making an RMS distortion measurement, distortion of noise over a wide band, um, you, you can sometimes find you, that, that your measurement doesn't really uh, pick up, uh, doesn't respond very much to some distortion, but you can hear it very obviously. And that's one of the reasons why this has been such a, a holy grail. A lot of companies have, uh, have tried to provide uh, electronic solutions for that uh, instead of having somebody sitting there listening to speakers on the production line, which is the way it used to be done, rather than buzz. And of course, uh, tube, tube amplifiers we're all familiar with, uh, noisy with significantly greater distortion than maybe uh, semiconductor amplifiers, but uh, people like the sound they make. So, sine wave measurements are useful to start. 
Measurements don't always correlate with your sub subjective impression. I think we know that, especially with all the work that's going on in loudness uh, at the moment, with the legislation that's going through about implementing loudness measurement in TV and, and all of that. So they're trying to make a measurement that correlates better with, uh, with subjective impressions. Now, <clears throat> the question of you know how do we how do we do that? Is it just a case of sitting there and listening to something and saying, oh well, that sounds the same as something else, or that? that measurement correlates with my impression of this. So yeah, job done, you know, that's a new measuring scale. You know, half an hour in, the, in an audio lab and the job's done. Well, it's not that simple. Um, human, you know, perception is Im immensely complicated and uh, one of the, uh, hopefully you'll go away uh, with, with a better uh, understanding of its, of its uh, strangeness after tonight. But um, I can really only scratch the surface. I'm not an expert in this, but, but this is, uh, a fascinating subject and we have to remember that when we're trying to compare you know what we're hearing and when we listen to interfaces listen to our speakers mic freeze and so on um, we've, we've got to be a little bit careful uh, in taking into account some of the strange things that happen when we're when we're trying to listen to things so let's skip on let's let's start with one of the, the first sort of perceptual um, subjects this is um, uh, a series of curves showing um, the um, hearing th threshold and it was uh, originally well it was actually there was somebody who worked on this before Fletcher and Martin. I don't know if anybody can remember the name of the other person but you probably all have heard of Fletcher Munson and the, and the white thing yeah? um, it was f further developed in fact a lot of what we attribute to Fletcher and Munson was actually produced by the two characters Robinson and Danson who came afterwards but what this basically tells us is that um, our frequency response um, at a given level changes uh, with that level. So as we get quieter, um, we have a more marked um, distortion of our frequency or our ability to, to perceive um, uh, a tone at an equal level. So we're we're sweeping a tone there and measure, you know, trying to measure how, how much energy we have to give it to make it sound the same as it goes across the frequency range. And at the lowest levels, um, we, we find that we have to give it a lot more energy at the <coughs> low frequency and quite a bit more even at the high frequency than in the mid-band to make it sound uh, a similar level. So this is a bit of a strange and non-linear aspect. And, and uh, this has been the basis for... Um, uh, for perceptual coders like AEC and the MP3 and so on. Um, this is not a nice summary of, of what we call masking, which is actually, an, sorry, masking, which is uh, another an, another facet of all this. The um, masking and the um, business of, of equal loudness are both uh, taken advantage of in these coders. Um, masking occurs when two tones occur near in, in frequency and time and uh, a stronger and a weaker and in many situations the weaker signal becomes imperceptible um, so there are two types of masking and we've mentioned frequency and time spectral masking when a loud sound distorts the threshold of hearing so in other words the loud sound we can hear but we can't hear the quiet things that are near to it um, and Temporal masking occurs when a loud sound, a very loud sound occurs, and before and after it, we find that other things that may have been quieter again become hard to detect. But there is a time uh, effect there as well. Um, so this is a, a visual representation, just giving you the idea of that. Um, and you'll recognise the shape of that curve, so-called fletcher munson uh, curve there. And we've got a high tone in the middle, of what we call the masking tone, and then. You can, the, the, the line that's sort of hanging from that like a piece of string is the modified masking threshold below which it becomes hard to hear uh, a, a nearby frequency. Um, I'd like to give you a little demonstration of that um, just, just for fun. Uh, maybe we'll go back to that slide for, for a moment. <coughs> and we'll see if we can prove that. Here we go. Uh, I might have to tweak the level of this a little bit, but what, what I'm going to do is I'm going to run a sweep 
on one channel and I'm going to run, I've just put a constant tone on the other channel. And I, I want you to put your hand up or respond in some way if the quiet tone disappears and you can put it down again when it comes back. We might have to try it a couple of times because I'm not sure about the, the level in the room, but this is just a really good example of masking. And you, you know, when you're listening to things and you're trying to listen to detail, remember this. Okay, so let's, let's see if we can do that. <coughs> Okay, that's sweeping really nicely, but I've got it muted. So I was just checking to see if you're awake there. Oh, it wasn't that one. It was that one that I wanted. And I'm going to solo that one. Okay, so there's my quiet tone. And we'll give it a go. So hands up when that tone disappears, and down again if it comes back. Let's just see if we can do that. Yeah, it does, isn't it? It's quite, it's quite loud, even the, the quiet tone. It's quite remarkable, though, isn't it? Okay. So back to our slideshow. Yeah, so it's real. It, it really happens. So that, all the detail that was there, you know, that little tone just disappeared for a moment. So think about that 24-bit resolution. And that's not the reason why I said they were the same, by the way. I didn't say they were the same. I said, who thinks that one's better than the other? We'll see that they're the same in terms of resolution in a minute. Um, so uh, sound quality, tricky. Not absolute, difficult to correlate. Um, let's move on. So are there steps in digital audio? Well, HD audio, high frequency sampling, 192, 384, more than that. You know, Does more samples actually mean that we've got less steppy audio? Anybody agree with that? Anybody think the higher sampling rates make it less steppy, less grainy? Nobody. That's good. I, I hope that you're all telling the truth. <laughs> um, low level resolution is preserved it, it is employed, you probably know that but um, even though we know these things sometimes we're a little bit unwilling to accept it CD is still a very valuable high quality reference, it has terrific resolution if it's done properly one of the things we're going to look at a little bit later is how well our CD reference recording can be reproduced when replayed and the possibility of various different kinds of uh, destruction of the audio. Oh, and the other thing I'm going to do before we dip into the psychoacoustic thing is, is debunk the clock box myth. Who thinks that having a central uh, oven-controlled atomic clock is a, a way of improving the audio if the, in your converting device or your Pro Tools rig? Anybody dare to go with that one? Come on, somebody must believe that. I have one, I don't know. You've got one? Yeah. Do you believe it? Um, I haven't heard anything yet. You haven't heard anything yet? Yeah. Okay. I mean, I haven't, I didn't have a problem when I didn't have it. Yeah. And I don't have a problem now that I have it. One thing that you might notice is that it might change the sound. The question is whether it's actually better, more pleasing, more accurate, or none of the above. And we'll, 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 we'll have a look at that as we go through this. So this is, I'm going to skate through this pretty quick because I think you, I think here most people are familiar with this material, but just in case uh, anybody has any questions, do stop me. So when we sample audio you know, into the digital domain, we need to know how much and when. And we store it as a sequence of binary numbers. So we have a sampling interval T. Uh, 1 over T is our sampling rate. Um, higher sampling rate, higher frequencies encoded. I think we're all familiar with that. So we're also probably, the Nyquist limit is important, I'm not going to talk a great deal about this tonight, but just a nice illustration of sampling um, here. We, we need to have a sampling rate at least double the highest frequency that we want to reproduce. I think what everybody that does digital audio in any shape or form knows that. Here's a nice little illustration of it. 
Um, if we take samples at those points, uh, uh, because this frequency violates the Nyquist criterion, um, what you might find is that you actually end up with something that looks like that. So that's just a nice little illustration of aliasing for you. Um, let's move on. Um, this is fairly obvious stuff. If you play your samples at a different rate, they come out at a different pitch. You know that because it's probably happened to you deliberately or otherwise. <coughs> Thanks. So let's um, skip through this. Uh, quantization. If we only have a fixed number of steps, you know, and they're quite coarse, um, we might not be able to represent all of the subtlety of the sine waves that we're trying to reproduce. So I've shown some lo the horizontal lines indicate our quantizing levels, and uh, you know, here we can oop, illustrate the idea of the error. Uh, there you can see on the bottom right. So you know. If we've got finite steps, we may not be able to exactly represent the right value. And this is this whole thing about HD audio and steps and higher sampling rate, more bits. It's the reason why people think 16 bits is better, which incidentally it isn't. Well, we'll come on to that. Um, this is just a rather nice illustration for um, those of us that are interested in the subject of dynamic range um, from the threshold of hearing to the threshold of pain. Um, Oh, it is what it is. Um, so this is just a little bit of uh, stuff about um, audio. 24 bits, you'd have 140 dB dynamic range. That's actually a little more than the distance between the threshold of hearing and the threshold of pain. Um, and of course, it doesn't stop there, because resolution, as, as we'll see, continues beyond that. Uh, although, going below 24 bits, but chances are you probably can't hear it. Um, so our audio bandwidth has to be at least uh, 20 kilohertz and 40 kilohertz sampling minimum. We need a bit of a transition band, so we ended up with 44.1. There are technical reasons why we ended up with 44.1 and 48. And I shan't go into that. So I won't dwell on that. Um, that's fair enough. So quantization. Um, so we're trying to represent this as a series of steps. And you know, you might think in a rather simplified world that if, if our sine wave isn't big enough to exceed the first quantizing step, then we just get nothing out. But in fact, what happens is that you get a square wave coming out because the transition point of that decision about you know, uh, whether it's positive or negative and so on is, is, is actually you know, right, right at the zero point. So what actually happens is that when we go below that quant quantizing step, we produce a, a square wave of the same amplitude all the time, regardless of how small our signal gets. Because it's still above zero or below zero, um, we, we lose the ability to resolve the amplitude. And uh, that's what we mean by loss of resolution. We can't resolve uh, the correct value of this of this signal, so we're producing a nasty square wave. Uh, well, in fact, it's not as well. After it's filtered, it won't be a square wave, but it'll be a, um, a, a reconstructed tone which doesn't vary in amplitude. We, won't, we can't control its amplitude below that level of quantization. So how do we get around that? Well, you, 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 you may well be familiar with the idea of dither, in which we um, introduce some noise into the quantizing process, and by a miracle of maths, the noise that we add allows us to resolve uh, smaller signals than would otherwise be the case with that, that, that least sig significant bit quantizing level. If I can just, I'll try and describe it in a qualitative way, and anybody that, well, give me marks out of 10 for that later, but um, if you think about it, um, you've got a signal that's too small to you know, but it's so small that it's only modulating uh, one bit, if you like. We're, we're, we're going from minus one to zero in our converter output. Um, it's the smallest thing we can represent. And so it doesn't matter what uh, the amplitude is, we're always going to get the same thing out. And we can't resolve any amplitude differences. If we add some noise into the 
system, what actually happens, it's not terribly well illustrated here, so I, I don't take this too literally, but what happens when we add noise um, is that we add a lot more transitions in, and we start, uh, the noise actually modulates um, the, the digital signal a little bit more than, um, the, than the original source would. And by a, by a miracle of mathematics, we randomly allow the, um, uh, by adding the wanted signal to the random noise, the wanted signal can randomly influence the state of that outgoing bit stream. And it's that randomly able to uh, influence bit that allows that resolution to be present. So the, the randomness of the noise is really important because if it's, the noise value is, is, is high enough, then you might flip a bit into the next state, and if it isn't high enough, then, then you don't influence it. Um, it's the best qualitative explanation I can give. So um, let's, let's stick with that, and then we'll skip on and, and see some examples of it. So what I'm going to show you is, um, actually it's a recording because I'm cheating tonight, but um, it's done this way. Um, we're going to run a 24-bit uh, audio source out of an Orpheus, and we're going to truncate it um, to uh, 16 bits, and then look at what we do with that. Look at the result of that, and um, listen to it truncated and dithered, and, and, and so on, just as a, uh, a demonstration. Now, um, as I say, I'm, I'm using a recording, but I'm, the recording was taken from this demo, so I thought it just saves me having to wire everything up. Um, I'm just going to play this. It might be a bit loud. Okay, that's not too unbearably loud. What you'll notice is this is going to fade down. It's getting pretty quiet. It's almost disappeared. So that's a fade from minus 80 to minus 130. Okay. So let's just keep that in our minds as we go forward. I've got a screenshot here um, just showing what I've been doing. Um, this time I'm going to play you uh, an example of a truncated and distorted sine wave. Um, in the screenshot there you can see that steffy triangular picture which shows a coarsely quantized um, single frequency stimulus and the purple trace shows me um, the tall purple bit in the middle which you can probably just about make out uh, is surrounded by a lot of hairy um, products either side which indicate uh, lots and lots of distortion products. So this is probably going to sound quite unpleasant but not surprisingly because um, we, we can't resolve the detail in this particular case because we're right at the quantization limit. So you can hear that nasty buzzy noise. It gets a little bit quieter. But it really hasn't gone to where it did before. You know, before it almost disappeared completely. So we've this is where we've lost our amplitude resolution. We're down to just, in its, at the lowest level, we're down to just two states. It's, that looks like a square wave on that screen when it's running live because we can't resolve the amplitude at the lowest levels. Yikes, that's horrible. So that's really quite unpleasant. That's what happens when it's truncated. Um, even if we try that with a narrow band filter. Um, in fact, I'm going to skip over this slide because it's rather dull. Um, 
uh, a narrow band filter is just going to give us a sine wave and it won't change much. Well, perhaps we'll play it and then we'll just skip on quickly. So that's the same signal, but with a narrow band filter, you can see the yellow filter shape. And that's, you can see the square wave that is the encoding of this tone. And it's not changing in level, it's not fading down in the way that our original example did. So we've lost the ability to resolve the, the fine detail because we're truncated. So if we try this time adding some divot, now you can see in the little triangular waveform um, some evidence of spiky bits of noise, which is the divot. And in the um, FFT plot, the purple curve, you can see uh, hairy bits, but much lower. So a, a, a relatively flat noise uh, c component and a single uh, spectral line in the middle, which is the wanted tone. <coughs> so if we listen to that, we can hear that fading out, or you will hear it fade out. Great. Getting quieter and quieter and quieter, so it's almost disappeared into the noise. So the noise is kind of masking the, the quiet tone, because we heard it all the way down in the original example. And there it comes back. It's pretty horrible, so... We'll skip on to the next bit. So... If we then uh, narrow band filter that as we did before um, and listen to it again, <coughs> and with, lo and behold, it will wonderfully fade down, <coughs> even though we're truncated to 16 bits and we're dithered. What you might be interested to observe at this point, I've turned it up a bit. Can you hear anything going on there? Any ideas what that might be? Uh, I cheated, you see. It was there, the original one that I played you wasn't actually 24 bit. The, the very first one where we, where we heard something similar to this, it was the same thing. Um, and what that is, is a little bit of noise in the narrow bandwidth of that filter, that, that warbly. It's a tiny bit of noise. So it's the noise component that's within that band, even, even though we're only modulating 16 bits. So it's 16 bit with flat dither, but within that narrow band, you know, there's a tiny bit of noise, but we can hear that tone nice and clean from minus 80 to minus 130. So we've got masses of resolution. Uh, even though it's only 16 bit. <coughs> but we've still got the noise, which is irritating. So how do we get rid of that? A bit about noise shaping. Pun intended, sorry. A technique in which noise is filtered to redistribute the noise power within the band to make it less audible. It uses the idea that the ear's frequency response changes dramatically at low levels, so we can shift some of the noise power into the higher frequency region principally, um, and lo and behold, we get rid of the noise magic. Problem is perception, uh, because mastering engineers tell us that different shapers sound different. And we've, a lot of us have heard the story of, of people making recordings perhaps 20 30 years ago that were said to be too quiet, too clean, and people would, some engineers, mastering engineers or cutting engineers, would add a bit of noise to the recording, and it would actually kind of liven it up a bit. You know, so there is this little bit of history behind this idea that the, the noise content of a recording actually changes the way we perceive it. Um, bear that one in mind as we go forward. Um, so here's a, a slide looking at four noise shapers. Um, I hope you can make sense of it. The, the brown one, there's a little legend here. The brown one is just flat dither. And then we've got um, uh, truncated without dither, which is the red one. And in the red case, you can see there's lots of red distortion points lurking there. So the noise floor is lower in the red case, but there's all the ghastly distortion that we heard earlier on. And then we've got four different noise shapers. And these are rather wonderful because uh, we, had to, we had to keep them anonymous for reasons of 
sort of commercial politeness and amongst anything else, other reasons. But um, <coughs> if I tell you how we came up with SNS2, um, SNS3 was a straight, straight out of the Lipschitz and Van der Koy paper on noise shaping um, and has been used by others uh, verbatim, uh, such as the Pau argument. Two was the fun, the fun one, because um, we used to work very closely with David Smith at Sony, um, who's sadly now no longer with us. But um, David was a good, a good friend actually, and uh, an enthusiast. Um, and I remember him showing me a very early SBM processor for dithering stuff down to 16 bits for uh, CD and in their Sony uh, mastering system. And uh, we pointed out to him that um, it worked very well, but there were lots of distortion products. And we could see the distortion products kind of shaped, but, but nonetheless they were there. There was no noise there, but the distortion truncation was there. So what we realized was that in that early version, they'd switched the dither off. They'd got noise shaping, and they were truncating, but the dither had been switched off. And I said to David, why, why was that? And he says, I don't know, it's, it's crazy. You know, we, we've wondered and speculated if somebody in the engineering lab, it switched off the dither to make it measure better. Um, I don't know. But they did change it in the end. And, and uh, they had turned the dither back on and it became SPM2. But, um, or it became SPM that was released. I can't remember whether it was SPM2 or exactly what the stage was, but they did change it. Um, but we got a letter from Sony in Japan a little while after that um, saying um, that they thought, oh dear, <laughs> that they thought we were infringing their IPR. I don't know if somebody can deal with this uh, label. Maybe I'll have a look. Um, and they said that they thought we were in infringing a patent that they got on, on this process of noise shaping. Um, so we wrote back <coughs> to them after a while and said, uh, well, we've had a look at your patent, and uh, it's very interesting. Um, what we think you've done is that you've patented the uh, process of noise shaping, which of course is already public domain. It's, it was published by Lipschitz and Van der Poy and so on, and it's been you know, well treated. But what you didn't patent <coughs> was the actual shape of the curve. It wasn't mentioned in the patent. So that's what we've copied, and we don't think we're infringing anything. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what two is. Um, one is halfway between UVA and UVB, um, uh, the effigy. Uh, approach to it, and three was the Lipschitz van der Koy, and four was um, a variation on it. Ah. Not good. Uh, sorry about that. <coughs> and there's a big difference between three and four, as we'll hear. Um, they, well, again, you know, we listen, to, in order to hear them, you've got to hear them, you hear them in an artificial way, which is completely inappropriate, of course, but um, let's just illustrate that. So we, we were truncating um, So there's our fade again. We can hear the 16-bit noise. I'm actually going to change and use a different stimulus for the noise shaping examples, which is more useful um, for them. So this is a, a bong. It's a modulated tone. Um, and it's truncated versus dithered. So there are two different um, examples, one after the other. That's the truncated one. You can clearly hear the distortion products. And that's the dithered one, which is cleaner but noisier. So let's try the next one. Um, and in this one, we've got truncated dither, and then with the four shapers. Oh, I need to go back to the PowerPoint from the player. That's the only thing. So that's truncated. That's dithered. That's SNS1. That's SBM. Well, similar to. And that's the three. And that's the four. 
They sound quite different, don't they? It's artificially high, but there's a three is a lot more sort of nasal. And that was back to do that again. <laughs> so that's that's quite an interesting illustration of the effectiveness of noise shaping. And we're actually preserving that resolution. So thinking back to the original demo of the fade up and fade down, um, we've got the resolution on that fade from 80 to minus 130. And, and, the, and here, we're not using a filter, but with SNS4, the noise has almost completely gone away, and we can hear all that detail in, in the bomb. So um, actually, the resolution you know, um, as such is, is, is preserved and is therefore not different markedly between those, those two formats, which is which was the point of the question at the beginning. Um, so, uh, moving on. Um, word length isn't necessarily something that affects resolution. Quite a, a, an interesting point. Um, yes, that's how it works. A noise shaping can re reduce the apparent quantization noise, but it, it may influence the way we we hear things. Of course, we don't want to noise shape things if we're going to be applying equalization and, and processing. It's only something we do right at the end of the chain um, um, because of the high frequency noise penalty and that if that were boosted, it would, it would become audible. So that's something we have to be uh, wary of. Um, so I want to skip on and look a little bit at clocking now because um, we've seen that we've got resolution there. We've got this fantastic level of performance, but uh, the problem is that it can all go horribly wrong if we don't take the sample at exactly the right time. Or if, when we take the sample, we don't actually correctly translate it into the digital domain. And there are two problems. One is being able to determine the time very precisely, and the other problem is being able to actually determine what the amplitude is and how we should scale that and represent it in the, in the digital domain. The amplitude bit... Uh, the, the, the clock bit's got a lot of attention over recent years, people with discussion of jitter, but the, the other bit has got much less attention, but it's just as important. Um, um, when we want to sort of uh, reproduce in a D2A or whether we want to measure it in A to D, we, we've usually got a voltage reference somewhere in the circuit, um, and we're going to compare in some way our stimulus or, or the wanted signal with that, with that reference. Um, and, and work out how to translate from the analog domain to the digital or, or digital to analog. If that reference is not absolutely perfect, and if, if it's not kept stable and constant and noise free down to the level of resolution that we're looking for, um, then our resulting conversion isn't going to achieve what we hope it's going to achieve. You know, so it's not just the time, but it's the a amplitude measurement as well, uh, both of which we have to get right. So, yeah, that, uh, sorry, that last slide is talking about the timing. So we can see an example there of clocking a waveform and achieving some values uh, which match what was transmitted uh, because we've, we've measured the, uh, the, the data transmission at the right time. Here we're talking about um, the issue of transmitting data between devices. Um, when we talk about clocking, we've really got two subjects to think about. One is synchronizing digital devices together so that their conversions can operate together. So, for instance, if you're you know, recording, I don't know, 48 tracks in Pro Tools, you want all the converters to be synchronized together um, so that we don't get sort of phase distortion and drifts in frequency between channels on different boxes. So we need to synchronize them, and that means um, you know, that we can transmit data between them or between them and other devices like the host computer uh, and, and have a, a correct result. So that brings us into the idea of, of jitter or an error in the timing of a clock. Um, the clocks with jitter have transitions at slightly the wrong moment and that gives us two potential problems. There's jitter at what we call the interface level. That's between devices. Um, and there's jitter... Um, that we call sampling jitter, where this actually is jitter in the point of sampling or reconstruction, both of them very, very important and both slightly having um, slightly different um, area of influence. Let's just have a look at interface jitter for a moment. Um, there are two effects uh, that we see on AES interfaces. 
Um, one is um, related to the sending equipment, uh, what we call that intrinsic jitter or FS jitter, as, as in that uh, statement at the top. And the other one is the effect of the cables that, that are being used, the capacitive loss that causes the integration and that characteristic sort of shark fin shape of the um, degraded signal there. Um, and that shark fin shape, you can see, when we try and take a transition in the middle of that waveform, in the midpoint vertically, uh, results in a, a timing error um, in the recovered digital data stream. So it's the capacitance of the cables that causes that, and just putting an AU signal down a cable will introduce a degree of timing jitter on the interface. So it's signal dependent too, because the ones and noughts, the sequence of ones and noughts, as you can see from that illustration, can affect um, the nature of the error. We've got a long pulse, which is a zero there in that stream, and you can see that voltage gets higher and it then takes longer to descend at the next transition. So it's data dependent. So here's a little example. This is um, actually a very simple example where we just transmit a signal over a drummer cable. I'm not actually doing it live, but I've got the cable here. In fact, later, if you want to play around with it, you're welcome to come and have a go. Um, but uh, in this case, <coughs> we're transmitting uh, a, a tone over a lossy uh, link. And um, the illustrating really here the danger of just taking a quick sort of listen on the monitors for granted and, and assuming that because it sounds okay, it is okay. Uh, bearing in mind that we are interested in this fantastic high resolution that we've been talking about of, of 24 bits or, or, or at least more than 16 bits and so on. Uh, we want to preserve the quality of our audio as, as far as we can. Um, so there's a, on the left a, a, a good healthy AES signal uh, and on the right a really bad one that's got lots and lots of problems. There's, you can see the integration but there's all sorts of uh, other problems in there. It's probably got some source jitter on it as well. Combination of both uh, uh, cable related and source related jitter components on that AES signal. Uh, sorry, moving on. So here's our a little sine wave tone. It's reasonably fair, isn't it? It's not too loud, it's not too quiet, you can't hear anything. So that sounded okay, right? So you flip that up on the monitor and you say, oh, it turns there, it's all right, it's fine. Um, if we take the distortion output of the D-scope that we were using to generate and monitor that, we'll hear something else. It's auto range, so there's a lot of noise modulation, and I apologize for that in advance, but you'll get the general point. Those are all the errors that were in that sine wave flip, and you weren't aware of them probably because of masking, because they're quite low, most of them. Uh, so that's, that illustrates the danger of not you know, pay, paying attention and taking care with your digital audio connections. I have to say, that's a bit extreme. Don't go rushing around and you know, <coughs> worrying about the two-meter cable between your uh, DAC and your CD player or your monitors or whatever, because that was using a 100-meter drum with some further <laughs> degradation added to it. Um, so it's quite extreme. But it, illustrates the point. It's probably more relevant if you're still piping AES around a radio station or a TV station or something like that. So let's um, move on. Uh, and this is, uh, now we'll look at the, is the issue of sampling jitter. So that was jitter on the interface causing data transmission errors. Now we're moving on to what happens with the converters. Jitter in a converter can lead to distortion. Of course, if we take a CD player, transport, Blu-ray player, whatever it is, and we've got an outboard DAC or something like that. Um, we've got a connection between them. We've got to transmit the audio, uh, and the audio's got to be synchronized for error-free transmission. So we've got to get the clock across to the receiving device. It's got to recover the clock and reconstruct the audio at its D2A converter. So it's got to recover the clock accurately and cleanly in order to produce a, a distortion-free output. Let's just have a quick look at some slides illustrating that. So if we move the sample point, quite clearly there's going to be an error in the resulting sample. And when we reproduce it, it'll produce a, a wonky waveform that, that isn't going to sound right and it is distorted. 
simple illustration. Now, um, J-test. Has anybody heard of J-test? Nobody's heard of J-test. Okay. If you read Stereo Farm, you might come across it. But it's actually something that is misunderstood a little bit um, in some quarters. What it, sorry, what it actually is, um, is a pathological signal that's designed to wreck the AACBU interface if there's some, uh, you know, if, if, if we've got a lossy uh, transmission channel with lots of capacitance and attenuation of the digital audio signal that we're trying to transmit. So it, it's, it, we've actually designed it from the point of view of the data pattern. Uh, it happens to contain some audio, which is convenient, that allows us to test it, but it's designed to upset the transmission path. But of course, it, it's designed to upset the transmission of AES EBU data. And just for your edification and amusement, I've got these illustrations of what the AES waveform might look like for each of the code states of this test waveform. Um, you can see that in some cases you've got long sawtooth pulses and in other cases you've got short sawtooth pulses. The short ones are ones, the long ones are zeros. And the fact that there are four um, is indicative of the fact that there are two tones in this. Um, there's a low frequency modulation and there's a high frequency modulation. Uh, the low frequency one is going at 250 hertz at one bit. Um, it's 100, uh, I think it's 250 hertz. Um, FSA over 192 is going to be running at 48k, so it will be 250 hertz. Um, the higher frequency is FS over 4, uh, which will be 12 kilohertz at um, uh, 48k sampling. So we've and, and the high high frequency. Uh, is just two different sample values because it's a half a Nyquist frequency. There, there aren't, you know, the only two values, and um, so that's at a high amplitude. And you can see, so the values of C and all the zeros and four and all the zeros show us that it's at a high amplitude um, signal, whereas the others are showing um, very close to. Uh, No, I've got that wrong. Sorry. Um, <laughs> we've got a large and a small one. Let's leave it at that. <coughs> so, we first we first published this in 1994. Um, if you haven't heard of it, then you won't have, have confused it with, with other things. But uh, it was published as a way of testing D2A converter devices that are driven by ASCBU uh, audio transmissions. And, and worst case data is induced by data changing state from all zeros to all ones. Uh, that's the low frequency, low amplitude part of this signal. Um, and it causes, a, uh, because all the bits are changing at once, it causes a phase modulation effect. But having said all of that, it should be very clear that J-test is only relevant in the context of AES3 and SPDIF. If you have a different data transmission format, then this particular um, argument about uh, stimulating the worst case uh, phase modulation in, in the interface doesn't apply. And it does get used, uh, it has been used I think in, in some publications, in articles in some publications, I don't know quite whether the publication was responsible, but it has sometimes been used in testing USB and firewire devices where it's <coughs> completely inappropriate because they don't use a format anything remotely similar to AES for transmitting the data between the interface and, and the computer. Um, so this was, this was the setup for this demo. Um, yes, I've got a firewire connection here, but that's not really... Sorry, no, I'm sorry. That's different, different altogether. Um, I'm transmitting two digital audio streams here, one in through the office, which is locking to it, although it's got the firewire connection, it's actually locking to this signal source here. And I, we had another box that remains nameless, um, to avoid uh, lawsuits and such like, um, to which we sent uh, an identical signal. And then we measured the outputs on a D scope uh, and recorded them so that I could play them back to you now. So here are the two FFT results. Um, I'll just sort of just tell you a bit about what these are. So this is average, which is why it's not fairly clean flat noise floor, and we can see uh, our central tone there um, 
in the middle quite nicely. Down here, uh, well, it's average as well, we've got our central tone. All of this stuff here um, are harmonics of that low frequency, the 250 hertz that I was telling you about. Um, they actually um, are sidebands <coughs> because the um, clock is phase modulated by the interference between the cable and, the, and that data pattern. Um, it's going straight through the clock recovery in this uh, rather finely phase converter. And the, the converter clock is modulated in the same way. And so we get a phase modulation. Phase modulation produces sidebands. So we've got our 12 kilohertz stimulus time, and we've got this whole series of nasty sidebands. Uh, because it's a square wave, it's just got lots and lots of harmonics, so they spread out either side and produce a really unpleasant <coughs> distortion effect. And the other thing that I've got here is I've put in a single tone modulation as well, just to, just to prove a point, to prove that you know, th this is cable related. Uh, this is that cable related data jitter that we saw in that slide earlier. And this is source jitter that I've deliberately added in the transmission device. Uh, at a single frequency, and that single frequency was in fact just the difference between that and that, and, and so hence over the other side you see the other side band. Um, so let's listen to the distortion products of these two things uh, and see how pleasant it is. <coughs> so this is the nasty one, just with the cable induced distortion. Can everybody hear that? I don't want to make it too loud. So that is the sound of the distortion produced by that data pattern. If I change the data or change that frequency, then that would suddenly become noise-like. But at that particular data pattern, it suddenly becomes really offensive. That's the audio distortion. I've taken the tone out, the 12 kilohertz, with the notch filter in the measurement system, and we're just listening to the distortion. And that's a pretty unpleasant distortion, isn't it? So let's listen to the next one. The next one is um, the same product, but with the source jitter added. So my sending device is now, um, it's a test instrument, the D-scope. I'm deliberately adding some jitter at 10 kilohertz, uh, which is those two large sidebands that you can see at the bottom trays, just to see if that goes through the clock recovery, which, of course, it shouldn't. Yeah. So that's pretty horrible. That's not in the audio that we're sending over the AES link to the device. It's just jitter on the AES interface that's getting into the converter through the clock recovery, modulating the, the tone that we want. See, that tone wasn't the 12 kilohertz. That was a 2 kilohertz um, sideband that, that you heard. Um, so all of that is all rubbish. It's not supposed to be there that is there. Let's have another listen. This is an Orpheus with 100 meters of cable, remember the buzzy one. Let's just see if it's playing. Yeah. Let's do the one with the 10 kilohertz. That's how it's supposed to be. <laughs> there is no difference in the game between those two examples. Okay. It takes a long time to get that stuff right, but that's what we spend our time on. And here's the two, just for your amusement, one after the other. That is playing. Do it again. So, it does make a difference. So, just as important. It's just one of many factors, don't get hung up on it. When I mentioned that um, um, amplitude issue earlier on, the voltage reference, Um, actually, before I get on to that, I'll just tell you a little story. Um, some years ago, we did a project with Sony and um, 
Doug Carson Associates about um, the problem that uh, things were coming back from pressing plants sounding not right. You know, people weren't happy. And there were some big artists that were complaining to Sony, people like Pink Floyd, Mariah Carey, and, and, and some others. And they were saying that discs were getting pressed and they, they didn't sound like, you know, the mastering engineer or the producer or whoever was in, you know, working on it was convinced that, that, that they didn't sound the way they should when they came back from the pressing plant. And uh, large lawsuits were mentioned and all that sort of thing, and we thought this has got to be worth getting involved with. There must be some something you know, here to study, and at the same time, it's, it's going to get some attention because there's so much money at stake. Uh, did, we didn't earn any money out of it, it was just that we got some attention out of it, which was sufficient for us. Um, so uh, what we did was we, we got involved in with the two sides, and, and we got an agreement from, from the record company, Sony, to give us some clips from the, some of the records that had been um, and we went, we went to talk to Doug Carson, who make uh, glass mastering equipment. And we did a project to research lots of different ways of getting to the glass masters through PDP, through you know, 1630 and other methods and so on, current at the time, and, and the CDR, I think, possibly. Um, and we produced a number of sets of discs, but we were very careful to randomize them and jum jumble them up. And, but we, we knew which ones were which. But uh, none of our listeners did. We, we went to a listening panel and asked them to listen to these discs. And we asked them to rank them in order. We've we, we given them a reference disc and say, would you rank these discs in order of difference? So the things that are most similar, we want to rank at the top and then you know, increase in order of difference. Um, and we asked them to describe their listening setups because we had no idea what the mechanism was at this point that might be causing these things to render differently and, and to sound different. And, uh, well, we did a lot of work on the, on the listening panel thing. We, had, we only had 50 listeners, and we had about 10 sets of discs. They were all randomized in different ways, so people couldn't compare notes, but a few of them might have done because they knew that they had discs set A, B, C, or D, or whatever it was. But you know, for the most part, there couldn't be too much uh, collaboration. Um, anyway, the results were random. It was uh, very unsatisfactory. But then again, you could almost predict that because they all had different listening setups. Um, you know, there, there might be some setups that were more prone to exposing a problem like this than others. Anyway, we did a, 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 a parallel research project in which we were measuring CD players, D to A converters, you know, looking for some evidence of differences. And lo and behold, we came across something very, very interesting, which was that when we picked certain CD players, we discovered that we could identify a specific disc by measuring the analog output of the player. I said earlier that we made, made a bit of a specialist uh, subject that was sitting on the fence. I was really pleased by this because it meant that we could go to the people that said identical discs. Oh, I forgot to mention that bit. We'd already checked all the discs to prove that they were bit identical. There wouldn't have been any point if all the discs weren't bit identical, but made by different methods. So when somebody said to us, well, there was, uh, I thought I heard differences and so on, we could actually take two discs from a set. They're numerically identical, they're just different. Perhaps they came from a different method or um, you know, mastering method or whatever, but they were just physically different discs. We could identify them by measuring just the analog output of the player. So it was true. They could sound different, even if they were identical from the digital point of view. And not only did we know that they were different discs, we found that we could tell the difference between the same test track played at the beginning, the inside edge, or the end, the outside edge. So it was absolutely fascinating. And it enabled us to sit firmly on the fence, which is fantastic. You know, we didn't say you can't hear the difference. Well, actually, we know that the difference, whether you can hear it, is another thing. But we know that it's there. And 
that turned out that lots of people were running around at the time with, plot, with FFT plots with lots of hairy distortion on them, like the ones we've been seeing, and saying to me and to my colleague Ian, look, I've got jitter in my CD player. But in this particular case, the mechanism that was causing that problem wasn't anything to do with jitter, even though it kind of looks similar when you look at it in an FFT. It was actually noise getting into the voltage reference in the converter. So I said earlier, you've got timing and you've got the amplitude, and you need to measure the voltage accurately, you know, to the precision of one pi in 10 to the 6 at least, um, if you're going to reproduce all you at this level. And uh, what, what was getting in there, and the reason that we could identify specific disks, is the signature produced by the servos in the transport to track that particular disk. So each disk is like a fingerprint. They're all slightly different. And so by measuring the characteristic that they produced, which got through into the converter through the voltage reference, you know, the, the action of the server and so on, producing electrical interference in the player, getting into, coupling into the voltage reference, modulating the output, amplitude modulating the output, which, oddly enough, rather like the jitter of the phases saw earlier on, amplitude modulation also produces sidebands. <coughs> but the, mod the, the, the mathematical relationship between the modulation and the product is slightly different. Uh, but anyway, they both do it. And that's why there was a lot of confusion about it and people thinking that they've discovered lots of jitter. Because they may well have been looking at you know, other deficiencies in the players. Anyway, long story short, don't get hung up on jitter. It's, it's not the only thing that goes wrong. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that was just what we just used that example to show you, you know, one way that things can go wrong because it's easy to do. So here's that common myth I wanted to debunk. External clocking will improve the sound of my XYZ box. Whatever, I've got this converter, it's a Pro Tools, it's a this or it's a that, and I put this atomic clock into it and it sounds way better, right? If clocking does change the sound, it means that the synchronization signal you're putting into it is affecting the audio output, which it shouldn't. You know, if, if it's working properly, then the synchronizing signal should simply lock it to an external clock source, but it shouldn't change the sound. So if the external clock does change the sound, you've probably got a problem with the clock recovery as distinct from running it as the clock master. The, the reason that there's a, a distinction is because most designs, when they're running as products running as clock master, it will run from a crystal oscillator, which is very stable. But when it's running locked to something else, it's using a circuit we call a phase lock loop. And those are notoriously difficult to design and get right. And in fact, a bit of a plug for us here, there are a whole plethora of patents on this subject, none of which have got me right. Um, because we're a small company, we don't patent things. We can't afford to defend them in all the courts all around the world. It would be too expensive. So we just don't tell people how we did it. Um, but the way that we do it, and the way that it was done, and it is done in that Orpheus box where we just listened to those demonstrations, is absolutely unique to us. And nobody else does it that way find all the patents that are out there. And the, the best patents that are out there haven't quite cracked the last problem. Um, so a good converter should be immune to varying clock inputs. Um, this is not to say that if you happen to like the sound of your system clocked from a certain thing, that there's anything wrong with that. You know, uh, we're, not, we're not arguing that you shouldn't do that. If that makes a good sound, then do it. Remember how you did it. Do it again. That's your secret sound, you know, for that type of music. And there is nothing wrong with that. You know, we're not arguing that, you know, uh, uh, you know again, in favor of some sort of um, dogmatic, you know, techiness, uh, you know, as against uh, creative... Um, uh, you know, the sort of creative approach. I mean, it, it ultimately, at the end of the day, it's what it sounds like matters. Um, 
the point is that it may not always be the same. You know, you may not always be able to get the same results. But um, thinking about what I was just explaining, uh, and particularly with the clock recovery issue, uh, and the fact that when a, a, a low-cost box, or not necessarily low-cost, but a, a box that doesn't perform well with an external clock may perform better from a technical standpoint when it's set to its master position. So here was an example where we just did it back to front. Somebody came in from this particular um, studio and said, how should we set up our clock to get best performance? And the answer is, well, we're not sure necessarily if this is as good as the Prism sound box, which is the ADA XR in this case. So run this as a clock master, because then it will perform to its best. Take the clock out of that, put it through distribution, stick it into this, which we know is beyond reproach does the clock recovery properly. So this is the absolute opposite of the, of the current popular wisdom on that subject. <coughs> uh, I don't know if any, anybody is familiar with that idea. So sorry about that. You, you might want to put that on eBay. But, uh, <laughs> do you do any video stuff? No. Oh, well then definitely put it on eBay. <laughs> um, so uh, having said all of that, you're probably going to ask the question, at least I hope you do, well, yeah, but can I hear any of that stuff? And so, let's take a look at some of this. Now, this, these slides, um, this is intended as slightly, ooh, that's really tricky, isn't it? <laughs> Let's see if we can start that slideshow again and make it work. That's better. Wow. That was quantized a bit on the side. Wasn't it? Um, this is, uh, you'll be pleased to know this is the, we're nearly at the end, but um, this is just a few slides to look at perception, which I hope you'll find rather fun. And at the same time, make you realize just how difficult it is um, in trying to assess things by listening and, and using using your senses. Um, and I've used a few examples, not I've used, but I've, uh, Hugh has, has, has brought into this uh, series of slides some visual examples as well, which are a, a good sort of um, complement to helping us to understand uh, you know, what goes on when we're um, trying to perceive things. So we know, we know that our senses can play tricks on us. You know, you, you, you sometimes... Uh, um, Sometimes it goes wrong. I don't know if it, took you a year to San Francisco, so that you came back on a, an overnight flight, you're probably very tired, right? Um, if you've ever been so, so tired that you're practically falling asleep despite everything, um, you might have experienced that um, effect where things in the room seem to start moving around. Has anyone experienced that? Yes, some of us. Uh, was that when you were at college? Or? <laughs> <laughs> um, but that's, you know, obviously they're not moving around, but, but suddenly we don't trust our own perception. And there, there are many sort of little uh, visual and, and audio paradoxes uh, uh, that, w that we can, that we can uh, use to illustrate that. Let's have a look. That's an interesting one. I don't know. How many of you think that that's moving? <laughs> it's kind of... The, the inside moves in and the outside moves out a bit. I mean, it's, it's hard to tell when you sort of concentrate on it. It isn't, or maybe it is. It's hard to tell. Here's a good one. Two pictures. Um, two pictures are the same. It's pretty straightforward. <coughs> but they're not. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. I mean, you don't sort of spot that immediately, but... Um, so sensual trickery. Um, th there are a number of examples in in audio, and, and particularly with speech, uh, speech and, and well, tonal um, examples, where, where we get confused or, or, or run into trouble with perceiving the things we're trying to perceive. Um, sine wave speech is is one we're going to look at. Uh, phantom words we're going to have a look at. Um, the uh, scale illusions I probably won't do, but the tone memory is quite fun, and I won't do the tritone paradox, but um, some of these are worth having a look at. 
and particularly when we're going through this, think about that time when you sit back in the studio in your listening room at home and you, you know, fold your arms and listen to the quality of what you're playing, you know, in front of you. And you may be doing an AVX test and listening to this and listening to that. Just, just think about some of these things. So, there is a serious side to this. We, we you know, we're relying on our sense of perception to make judgments and do the jobs we do. And one of the things you're going to see now is that your expectations or your previous prior experience may actually lead you to hear things that simply aren't there. Uh, and that's quite worrying when you're trying to assess things by listening to them. And the converse is also true. Well, we've already demonstrated that because we did that little masking demonstration earlier on, didn't we? Um, sine wave speech. This is, we're just using this to illustrate this is just something we're making use of. I don't want to go into the detail of what this is about. Um, but suffice to say that it's an artificially degraded, it's not actually degraded from a speech sort of recording. It, what it actually is is a, a synthesis or a synthesized speech using a very crude mechanism of three tones that are modulated. And it's designed to be like speech but with a lot of the important stuff removed so that you can't actually make sense of it. So just a little brief slide about that. Um, they studied speech and synthesized it in a particular way. There was also a, a, an approach to this using noise, but I'm not going to, to use that tonight. So, uh, sine wave speech. <coughs> Let's have to listen to a speech clip, first of all. She cut with her knife. It's pretty straightforward, isn't it? Maybe a bit louder. She cut with her knife. Hear that? So here's a sine wave speech version of that. Um, this is the sine wave speech formants. She cut with her knife. You can still make it out there, can't you? But only because you know what it is. If you didn't know what it was, you'd have a, a lot of trouble making sense of it. Let's look at some examples. Um, I'll start with a hard one. Can anybody work this one out? Any ideas? No. All right, let's try an easier one. Any, any takers on that one? Good one. Yeah, good. You guys are good at this. Let's, so let's take them from the top. <laughs> They're buying some bread. She ironed her skirt. She ironed her skirt. Now they all make sense. You got that one right. The floor was quite slippery. The kettle boiled quickly. The man's painting a sign. The man's painting a sign. The camel was kept in a cage at the zoo. The camel was kept in a cage at the zoo. That's a bit harder, that one. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, if we move on, um, we can then play them back later, and you can still work them out much easier now. She boiled her skirt. Easy. Because you know what it is. What was that one? Buying some bread. Yeah, easy. Because you know what it is. Dare I suggest <laughs> that it's the power of suggestion. So we're kind of hearing things that weren't actually there, or at least, uh, you know, barely there. Uh, a lot, of the, a lot of this research comes from um, researchers, uh, subject to these few slides, is, it comes from Diana Deutsch, who, who I thought I would mention and credit um, as, the, as the originator of the work. Um, and she uh, has written books and published various uh, discs and so on about that, the issue of perception. Um, Familiar visual paradoxes. Let's have a look at this. Now, 
this is just your eyes playing tricks, but think, you know, think about these things because you, you, with sound, you, you know, you have lots of other strange effects. We've been looking at a couple of them so far, but um, I particularly like this one because this is a black and white photograph. Does anybody know who that is, by the way? You, you probably don't. Not even by guessing by looking at the speakers illustrated in the wall behind. Um, it's Pete Thomas from PMC, the loudspeaker company, uh, if you're interested. What, what, what you're going to do for me is you're going to tell me what the colours are on that panel behind it without seeing the colour photograph. And you're going to get them right. Well, most of you. Most of you are. I'm not going to ask for all of them, actually. I'm only going to ask for one of them. The one I'd like you to focus on, the one we're going to look at or, or think of is this one here. You're going to tell me what colour that is and you're going to get it right. In order to do that, you've got to focus on this dot here. Okay? So, um, I want you to look very hard at that black and white dot. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a negative image. So I'm, che I'm cheating a bit, but I'm not showing you the colours. Okay? Any photographers among us? Do you know what the colours are then from that? Don't tell us. You'll spoil it. So keep focusing on that white dot. Focus, focus, focus on the white dot on the shirt. What colour was it? Green. Yeah. <laughs> That's pretty amazing, isn't it? How does that work? So it's really tricky, this, this sensory perception business, isn't it? Really tricky. Um, Phantom words. This is another interesting one. This is this is makes use of well, these some of these make use of stereo and um, might be interesting later to try moving back and forth or moving between the speakers because it really changes the effects that we're listening to. But let's just try it statically for the moment. Um, So can you hear any of those other words? The word that's synthesized there is Hilda, but you just hear it, depending on where you pick up on it, you may hear different words. There's some more examples of it. Some of them are a bit more dramatic than others. This one's quite good. It's funny, the experience of it is really the experience of it is really different listening to it in a different environment. So listening to it on the desk in the hotel produced a very different set of you know experiences and I focus on different alternative words. Uh, this is this is quite a good one. Is that Harvey or Coffee? So here's another one. Oh. Respond. No, pretty weird stuff. The sounds as they appear to you are not only different from those that are really present but they sometimes behave so strangely as to seem quite impossible. This is, this is Diana Deutsch. Um, so she came across this um, musicality of speech thing. She's got quite a musical voice, actually. I think you probably agree. But, um, oh, I had a little problem with this earlier on. I might have to restart the presentation just to get this back. The sounds as they appear to you are not only different from those that are really present, but they sometimes behave so strangely 
as to seem quite impossible. I'm just waiting for the next clip. Oh, I had that problem earlier on. I think it might be some sort of bug in PowerPoint. Let me just try and restart that that one to get it to work. The sounds as they appear to you are not only different from those that are really present, but they sometimes behave so strangely as to seem quite impossible. The sounds as they appear to you are not only different from those that are really present, but they sometimes behave so strangely as to seem quite impossible. But they sometimes behave so strangely, they sometimes behave so strangely 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 so strangely so strangely so strangely so, so this is a bit like hypnotism, this one. Yeah. Has anybody been hypnotized here? Nobody want to admit to that? Sometimes people with personal problems. No. <laughs> um, you have to go with this. Don't, don't resist it. Um, but uh, that's kind of musical. It's a sing song. She sings that bit. Whenever you hear that, she will be singing. And when you hear her speaking, she'll be speaking. The sounds as they appear to you are not only different from those that are really present, but they sometimes behave so strangely as to seem quite impossible. <laughs> isn't that weird? That's just suggestion, isn't it? You know, yeah. <coughs> Is that a musical speaker? Or, uh, here's, here's another odd one. I mean, just a couple of bits of fun now, really. Th these are different in the different sides, and I think it'll work much better in here where they're well separated. Um, we've got scales with a high, alternating high and low note um, on each channel. But the way we often perceive this is actually that we have a chromatic scale, an opposing chromatic scale in each channel, instead of the reality of them being bouncing up and down in each channel. Do you get what I mean? You can see from, if you can read the music, you can see you know, what's going on, a low and a high, low and a high, low and a So listen to it and see if you, can, see if you hear it as descending on one channel and ascending on the other. Oh, I like the sound of that. I've got all the fun games tonight. Let's just see if we can...
was going up and down and up and down on each side, or whether it was each side was, you know, opposing chromatic scales. Strange. Um, here's we're, we're nearly there. Here's a, here's a little thing about tone memory. Those those of you that sort of uh, you know interested in the sort of musical side of things and whether things are pitched right and all of that. This is quite a tough one. In this case, um, where you play two tones separated in time, can you identify whether they're the same pitch or not? Tone memory. Um, it depends what goes in between them. If there's nothing in between them, it's not very hard. different. Different. Quite easy. This is much harder. This next one. And the next one, uh, there's music, musical tone. So the tone, you want to remember the first tone, there'll be some more tones, and then a gap and then a tone that you have to guess is either the same or different than the opening note of the sequence. That was the result of the previous one. I think we all agreed with that. Same? No? Oh, we've got a split vote here. Okay, let's take, let's take the next one. You think that's the same? Last one. <laughs> it's hard to do, actually, isn't it? So we're thinking about, you know, pitch. Is, is this pitch right? I mean, that's a semitone. That's an, that's, that's an ocean away. <laughs> Nine, three, one, six, five, eight. Philadelphia, da, da, da. No, sorry. <coughs> I'm not going to sing. <coughs> Four, eight, three, seven, ten, one. Different. Six two nine eight five three. Yeah, I think we got that. So yes, that's, that's kind of tricky stuff. And this is just a final example: the endless scale of perception of pitch. <laughs> appear to you are not only different from those that are really present, but they sometimes behave so strangely as to seem quite impossible. So you've learned that. That was suggestion. You think it's there because you think it's there. So, things are not always what you say. <laughs> so there we go. Thank you. That's it.
anybody want, yeah, anybody any questions on today? Or, uh, yeah. Uh, so going back to your uh, question about the commission talking about resolution, I think what, is what you're saying is that resolution is something like being able to resolve plus or minus half of an LSD, right, which is completely independent of dynamic range in terms of... Well, nearly, yes. Uh, what, what, what I'm saying is... I've defined resolution as the ability to resolve a tiny difference in the amplitude or the pitch, actually, of a signal within <coughs> the range that we can represent with our digital sampling system. So it has to be within the frequency range that is up to just less than half the sampling rate. And, well, any amplitude will do, as long as we don't overload the conversion and flip it and then of course we then lose some of our resolution at that point. So if we're not flipping um, and not exceeding the Nikos frequency then you know, we can resolve pretty much any pitch or amplitude within that range and amplitudes down to tiny fractions uh, as be. You know, we went from minus 80 to minus 130 range about 50 dB, that's about an 8 bit range if you think of it in those terms. So yes, that's that, that's how I'm defining resolution. But it's an interesting point because anybody here a fan of SACD? You're a fan of SACD. Good. Well, SACD is um, none other than one bit PCM. You know, um, and uh, what what you've got is a high sampling rate, six megahertz or so, and you've got three megahertz within which to distribute that noise energy. So you can take a great big slice of it out at 20 kilohertz, zero, you know, DC to 20K. And instead of just having a little bit of space between 15 and 20K for your noise shaping, as you do with noise shaping in the CD context, you know, to try and mitigate the effects of dither, you have up to 3 megahertz, a massive range, to take that big slice of noise there and sort of put it up there and end up with a very good dynamic range. Uh, within the 20 kilohertz band. The only, if, if the quantizer, the one bit sampler, is divot successfully, then you've got this wonderful linearity um, and dynamic range, even though you've only got a one bit sampler. But if you've read Lipschitz, you'll know that that's not quite right, and that, uh, that it's impossible to actually properly divot a one bit uh, quantizer. Um, but it is kind of splitting hairs because it does have. Um, you know, nonetheless pretty good performance, but it can be made better still uh, by uh, allowing it to, to modulate more than one bit, but not very many. Um, so, the same principle of resolution applies in that, in that case, as does in the case of going from, 16, uh, from 24 to 16. But it also happens that you can take your digital stream from SACD and stick it through a resistor in a capacitor and produce that and decode it out. But that's kind of just a quirk of, of that particular coding. Yeah? I noticed that you had, even with the even with the Orpheus, uh, with the Vermont's dynamic range, there was a tiny little bit of spur on the bottom of the of the single uh, thumb curve. Yeah. Um, there are probably many sources of extraneous noise um, of which that may be one and it, it, it would most likely um, well it depends what the mechanism is actually by which it's getting in so you know, there are, it could modulate in one form or another or indeed possibly do something else it could, it could add in so there are a variety of ways that it could have put things um, were you thinking of the dither examples? no I'm thinking of just, just, just a pure tone well, no, when, you, when you said um, you heard some, some extraneous noise I didn't say I heard it, I was just wondering who heard it oh, oh I see what you mean I thought you, you heard something you didn't expect because <coughs> what I didn't do was the, one, the very first one where I played the tone that went down and came back up um, when we did those samples, we forgot to do the 24-bit one. 
So instead of having a 24 bit one, um, I just used the uh, feathered one with a notch filter to yeah. illustrate the point. And then the little warbling that you might have noticed at the bottom yeah. there was the, the inbound noise, which I pointed out in a later slide. It was that they were actually identical. Yeah, I remember that part. I was just wondering if you were running all over that noise coming through. Yeah. Um, I, I can't really comment on that, but I mean, other than to say that there, you know, when you get down into the, the depths and you're looking at what's in the noise floor, there are many sources of that, but one hopes that it, it is broadly white and, and clean in its composition. You know, nothing sticks out too much. Okay. <laughs> Any other questions? Whether that was the exact mechanism and whether that applied to all of the CD player samples that exhibited this problem, I can't recall. But the, the principle is not, does not require the power supply to be involved, but it could be. Um, or the, the problem you've got is that you've got this voltage reference sitting in the converter electronics that's got to be absolutely pristine. And however, you know, stuff gets into it. It could be your cell phone, it could be mains hum, it could be something from the power supply, or it could be ground noise, or it could just be induced in the circuit by proximity, you know, from the servos. But it, it just gets in there somehow. Uh, and the servos can get in. It doesn't have to be through, but through the power supply, but it could be. So it is a design deficiency, correct. The solution to that, of course, if you have, you know, if you're worried about the CD player, is use an outboard deck because then that's not going to be affected at all. But that's got its own problems. And when we looked at the later problem of clock recovery and those jitter noises and so on, you know, as soon as you connect an outboard deck, you swap one set of problems for another. Any other? I have one question about the four examples of noise shaping. Oh yeah. And the origination of those four examples, they were all the Mercer was no, one of them was from Sony. One of them was like, but not identical to the Apogee uh, UV22A, UV22B. There, there are two curves that Apogee did, right. and we just made one that went in between the two as a kind of in the style, right. although we never actually. But the number four promoted that. The, no, the number four, um, it's a slight variation on the the stock lip, Lipschitz implementation, but it. it what was interesting, I, I noted it, and we didn't dwell on it at the time. It was only slightly different from three, but it's, it sounded right. quite different, didn't it? Right. Yeah, that was remarkable. Right. It's something yeah. I've been kind of yeah. dealing with, the sort of noise shaping. Well, two, two problems with that. Yeah. One is that yeah. listen, listening to it at that level is completely inappropriate. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, you know, having bearing in mind all the things we've seen, you know, about masking, we, we saw that masking demonstration right early on, so anything that's slowed down is likely to be masked by things that are, you know, of nearby frequency that are a bit louder. Um, uh, there's not a lot of high frequency energy in classical music, so noise shaped classical music might not be thoroughly masked. Well, this is what I've been working with. So yeah, interesting. And, and it's like that people say that um, you know, noise shape, you know, the presence of noise can affect your perception. Well, we know that perception is a weird thing, having seen those mm -hmm. latter set of slides. Um, yeah, it may well be true, and it may be more likely to influence certain kinds of music. But I, it was one of the times it was pointed out to me, and I struggled to, to hear it, um, but the people I was with at the time were um, quite adamant that the, that the character of the sound was quite different using two different shapers. It was a Quincy Jones record with a hand clap. And hand clap sounds quite different with different shapers. Apparently. <laughs> uh, the, uh, I think the, the, the tone memory thing is quite interesting when you think about A, B tests, isn't it? Mm -hmm. You think you're going to go A, B, X. You know, 
can you really remember what A was like? <laughs> and if you thought A was like a thing, then it'll probably sound like that. You know, because when, uh, the suggestion thing that we, that we also looked at. So, you know, one of the things that Hugh, Hugh uh, who originated this uh, collection, this presentation, this section of the presentation, recommends that, that listening should be done not AVX, you know, rapid fire, but just listen to something, live with it, you know, get used to it for a little while, put it away, leave a little bit of a gap, and then come back and listen to something else, and just try to, you know, examine the detail and try to, you know, very proactively listen to things, um, and, and just be aware of all the ways in which you can form yourself, because it's you know, possible to do. So yeah, I mean, I, it's quite an interesting thought that noise shapers might. You know, music that doesn't have so much energy in the high frequency might be more prone to be uh, affected by the blue frontier. Yes, for me, anyway, because up until this year, I was not using my shaping as doing simple dither. And, yes. And I thought it was okay, but then I came upon these about three different types yes. of noise shaping that I could use, and it really, one of them, when you went down to 16 bit, it really did sound much better. Well, it's an interesting point because when it's dithered, it's got the, the resolution is preserved, so you've got the accuracy um, that, that you had if you had a higher word length. If you if you captured it at 24 bits, uh, you know, if, if you if you captured it at 16 bits and it was dithered, that would be okay. The resolution would be there. Whatever you captured it at, if you end up on the CD and it's dithered, mm -hmm. then you've got that high resolution uh, in terms of the resolution of detail and low levels and all those things. Um, so the dither version is accurate in that sense. It's just got this you know, little background of the noise. When you then introduce noise shaping, you're introducing this idea of, of excess noise because you're adding lots of noise. You know, it might be you might have noise up at minus sixty, minus seventy or even more, you know, as a result of adding the noise shaping. Um, according to the Fletcher London Thing that's inaudible, but then again, that's what they say about MP3. <laughs> uh, well, it's a combination of MP3. You've got masking, but they've also taken into account, you know, that. And then Fletcher Munson is about look what happens if, as you reduce the level and change your frequency response. Uh, but uh, yeah, I don't, no answers to that really, but interesting. So I'm, I'm not saying that one is better than another. It's just it's different. Actually, and if you like it, you know, print it. <laughs> yeah, good points. Any, yeah. any other questions? I understand that our ears are usually pulled and reception is a tricky thing, but sure. is it not true that someone who is more of a trained listener will be less subject to some of these uh, sources of deceit? That's a good question. Let's illustrate that. <clears throat> I think it is true. I agree with you. But I'm going to show you something that suggests that maybe it's not true. <laughs> oh. Oh, it's decided to save the document. Um, let's just go back to. So um, these will be so obvious now. The Can you unhear that? Can you get back to that just being a random sequence of tones? It's quite hard, isn't it? So you think so? Yeah, yeah. I just give you both sides, you know, you could say yes, I mean, you, when you listen critically to something, you know, you can listen to something to make sure you're, it's a bit like proofreading, isn't it? When you proofread something, if you skim through it, you might miss spelling mistakes, um, and you're reading what you expect to read, but if you can overcome that by reading it almost letter by letter, and, you, and that's the skill of proofreading. So, in that sense, you can overcome the perception problem. Uh, but I found it very hard to do with these examples. <laughs> these things are weird because I cued in on example four because the word boiling. Yeah, you really got so that. It's so vowel sensitive. Yeah. We're talking vowels in the sideways. Yeah. I didn't get any of that. 
But it's an interesting point. I, I don't, I don't know very much about subjects, and I'm not the best person to ask about. But I think you know, if you're interested, I would recommend having a look at Dr. Deutsch, and, and, and you know, looking at maybe reading some more there. But one thing I think we could observe safely about it is that I don't think there's any guarantee that the degree of um, you know, degradation or the loss of information is necessarily a constant through all of the examples. <coughs> Any other questions? Well, I'm done. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>